God. Amen. Come on, stand for the reading of God's word today. Hallelujah. Who's the most excited person in the house today? I'm like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How many just felt the presence of God during worship already? It's just been so, so amazing. I want to go back to the book of Judges. And we got a few announcements we're going to make at the end of the service so everybody will be on the same page. We got connect groups that are getting ready to start back up. We got some sign up sheets in the back, and we'll make announcements at that at the at the very end of the service so everybody can be caught up with what's going on with that. Judges. I think somebody ripped the book of Judges out of my Bible when I was worshiping. There it is. Okay, I got it. Judges. Judges chapter 6. I'm using this as a proof text. Uh, I'm trying to get to Gideon. He's still in there. And uh, we're trying to get there to him. I'm using this as a proof text so that we can understand the spiritual climate in which we're living in. How many know that the spiritual atmosphere, the climate, however you want to call it, that's in our nation has affected everybody? And it's, and it's easy, if we're not careful, to just put a lot of negative into an atmosphere. And whatever goes into an atmosphere, if it gets sustained long enough, that atmosphere turns into a climate. And the climate is stronger than an atmosphere. And then whatever stays sustained long enough into a climate, it becomes a stronghold. And the stronghold that's been sustained long enough over time becomes a culture. That's why, how I many know we got the church has to put the right things into an atmosphere so that it can get sustained for a length of time, then it becomes a good climate. I know it's a holiday, but where's my amens at? Somewhere out here. And then and then and then the sustained climate becomes a stronghold. How many know you can have some good strongholds? You can have some bad strongholds, but you can have some good strongholds. And then in a good stronghold will produce a good culture. And so that's kind of what we've been working on. And I've just been attacking it from every angle that I felt like God was leading me into. And so today we're just going to just push on it a little bit more. Um, I still feel that oomph from last week. And uh, I'm still working on it. Amen. So we're going to just, I feel like preaching today. I got three people right over here. I just, I just, I just want, I just want to, I just want to push on climates and atmospheres and let the devil know you trespassing, you trespassing. Take dominion and authority over every invading spirit. Amen. So Judges chapter six, we're gonna work with it a little bit. Judges chapter six, verse number one. Just follow along with me because it's good to know what's in your Bible and, and how God relates it to us in our day. Judges chapter. 6 verse number 1 says and then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years somebody shout seven years and the power of Midian prevailed against Israel and because of Midian the sons of Israel made for themselves uh, the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds for it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come in with the Amalekites how I many know that your enemies are always going to find friends? The Midianites came in with the Amalekites, and they found some more friends, and they came in with the sons of the east. In other words, Moab got involved. So now you got not only Midian, you got the Amalekites, now you got Moab. How I many know that misery attracts company? Hallelujah. And, and they came and they went against them, verse number four. And so that they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. And they would leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For, when, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents. And they would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable. And they came in to the land to devastate it. They came in to the land the devastated. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel began to cry out 
to the Lord. And verse number 11 says, And then the angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the yoke that was an Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizurite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. One translation says, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are his miracles? You ever had that prayer? Lord, if all this is going on, where are you? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? saying, Did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength, deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Somebody shout, the devil is defeated. That's what we're talking about. This is my my, my, my text. My title has been in this particular series. Every generation has a time. Every generation has a time. I don't know about how you feel about the times in which we're living in, but I believe it's time for this generation to get back to victory that the enemy has been taken from us Come on, push on somebody and tell them, now is the time. Now is the time. I want you to find about three people. Maybe you got to walk around and shake them real good and tell them every generation has a time. Every generation, every generation has a time. Every, every, every generation has a time. Every, every generation. So, Father, we thank you this morning for what you're going to do in this place. Holy Spirit, you're the preacher, the teacher. You're the revelator. You're the communicator. Holy Spirit, you reveal all truth. Lord, there is no truth apart from you. You are truth. Jesus, you even said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Anybody else that comes through that door is a thief. Lord, we thank you today that your truth will prevail in the midst of a culture that has rejected you. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this house. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we give you all the praise all the glory in advance, and we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody together said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you this morning. You may, you may be seated. In our text today, we find where the, uh, the nation of Israel has been reduced to uh, a level of living that they were never designed to live by. They were reduced into a particular category of living that was never designed by God for them to live on that level. The Bible says that the nation had been brought very low. They were oppressed, and they had been suppressed. And in fact, the Bible went on to say that the land had been devastated by a relentless enemy that came in year after year for a total of seven years. This particular nation of Israel in this particular time They had been living in dens and caves that they had dug out of mountains because of the oppression that they were feeling from their enemies and that the enemies were putting on them. For seven years, somebody shout seven years. For seven years, the nation had been in a perpetual struggle that has left them totally devastated. The Bible says there was no sustenance left in the land, no ox, no cattle, no donkey, no vegetable, no farming. Every year when the crops got ready to be harvested, the enemies would come in after the Bible says Israel had sown, after they had planted their seed, after they had watered their seed, after they had fertilized their seed, after they had cultivated the ground, after they had worked their seed, right at the time of harvest when the seed got ready to be harvested, Right at the time of harvest, the enemy would come in and destroy all their crops. How many know that's what's going on in our nation today? Right at how many how many how many have been just planting your seed and believe in God and you've watered that seed and you prayed over that seed, you fasted over that seed, you kept it in prayer this whole time, and right at the time of harvest, it's like the enemy comes in and he just steals your harvest. Can I tell somebody this morning already? I got some good news. It's about to turn around. 
It's about to turn around in Jesus' name. The Bible says there was no sustenance left in the land. Moral depravity had became its all-time lowest, while pagan worship and idolatry became its all-time highest. Understand now just that, that, that the reason why Israel had become oppressed by their enemy, it wasn't because Midian was stronger than Israel. It's just the fact that Israel had grown spiritually weaker. Something happens to a nation, to a people who say they love God, and they grow spiritually weaker than the enemies coming against them. What gives us the advantage over the enemy is not our military power. It's not our strength in ourselves. What gives us the advantage over our enemies is our trust in the Lord. It's our spiritual ongoing maturity in the things of God that gives us the advantage against the enemies of our life. The thief comes to kill and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come to give you some life. I come to give it to you more abundantly. It's the thief that comes in to take what you have, but Jesus said, I came to give you something back that you can throw it back into the enemy's camp and say, you can't come up in here. So, so when Midian now comes to us, it's, it's, it's a worldly picture. It's a picture of the world. In fact, you can study this out on your own time. You'll find out in Numbers 22 that it was Midian and Moab that joined forces, and they tried to get Balak, their king, to come and uh, to persuade Balaam, the prophet, to prophesy against Israel. And Balaam said, I, I, can't, I can't curse what God has blessed. Yeah. And then you find out in Numbers 25, it was Midian and the Moabite women that began to seduce the men of Israel and that turned their hearts into idolatry, and they began to sacrifice to false gods. Israel was on a downhill plane. They, they began to grow spiritually weaker, and the weaker they got, the more advancement their enemies had against them. The Bible says because Israel, this is what we read in our text. I'm going to get to where I'm going. Just hang out with me for a moment. Because Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, their enemy was empowered. Yeah. I feel this now. The reason why the Midianites gained the upper hand over the nation is because the nation fell out of agreement with God. Anytime a nation, a people, a group, a church, a person falls out of agreement with God, then the enemy gets empowered against your disagreement with God. Because what you disagree with means you agree with something else. So when you disagree with God, that means you are agreeing with your enemy. And what's happening, can I just preach it the way I feel it now? That, that what's happening, and I'm just trying to help us to understand as a people living in a nation that is divided, as a people that is living in a nation that is spiraling out of control, and you don't have to be political, you don't have to be prophetic to see any of that. You can be anybody, and you can see our nation is spiraling out of control. It's because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. When you have a nation that's been built on the principles of the Bible, and then you have a people People that no longer adheres to the scripture of God's word and you say God we can handle it this far now without you and you turn your face against God you have empowered your enemies to take over you empower your enemies to take over that's true for a nation that's true for a church that's true for a life that's true for a family that's true for your children the Bible says they did evil in the sight of the Lord, the Bible says, look with me in Judges chapter 6 again. This is not on the screen. Let me, I'll just read it to you. Judges 6.10 says, I, I, the Lord said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. They, they were living in an enemy's territory, but God said, I'm going to give it to you. But you have not obeyed me. One translation says, you have not listened to my voice. This will be on the screen for you. You cannot exercise kingdom authority over any spirit that you remain in agreement with. God said, I, I put you in the land to overthrow your enemies. But because you have not obeyed me, 
because you have disobeyed me, you have empowered your enemies to overthrow you. It's not that your enemies are stronger, it's just that you have become spiritually weaker. Can I just prophesy for a moment what's about to take place, not only in this house, but in America and around the world, the church is about to get their fight back. The church is about to get their position back. The church is about to get their stance back. And we're going to say back to the enemy, you have run roughshod over my family long enough. You have come into my land. You have come into my sphere. You have come into my territory. You have ruled and reigned in the midst of my family, my marriage, my children, my finances. But I'm about to throw the fight back in you because I'm coming out of agreement with the powers of hell and I'm coming to an agreement with the army of the living God. Yeah. Push on somebody and tell them every generation has a time. Every generation has a time. The time cannot be more critical than what it is right now. How long do you want to keep living under the hand of Midian. How long will you just let the enemy keep ruling and robbing your joy, your peace? Sooner or later, you got to answer the questions. Am I going to keep empowering the enemies who I have authority over? Or am I going to get into agreement with God who has power over the enemy? I heard Pastor Porter prophesy a while ago, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that will quicken my mortal body. What's true of Jesus is true of me. If he had power over the enemy, then I must have power over the enemy because I'm seated with him in heavenly places. What is powerful in heaven is powerful in my life. And so there has to come this, this, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but it's the way God deals, it with, deals with me. There has to come what I call this attitude of your faith. Yeah. You, you got to get an attitude of your faith. The church has been way too passive. Yeah. The, and, and I know, I get, I'm not talking about being, I'm not talking, we need to be meek. <laughs> I'm not talking about being proud and ar ar arrogant. Yeah. Huh? Pride comes before a fall. I'm not talking about being proud. And sometimes we boast in our Americanism with pride. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having, having an attitude in your spirit that says, if God gave it to me, why in the world would I just turn my cheek around and let the enemy come up in here and steal what God has blessed me with? God has never given anything to mankind so that we could turn it over to the devil. God has not blessed me with anything so that I could release it back into the hands of the devil. If God gave it to me, it was for my benefit. It was for, listen, I, don't, I didn't have to earn healing. I just received healing. I didn't have to earn salvation. I just received salvation. I don't have to earn deliverance. I just received deliverance. And sooner or later, you got to quit saying, well, that's just the way it is. Everybody dies. Everybody gets cancer. Everybody has COVID. No, no, no. Sooner or later, you got to put your foot back down in the face of Midian and say, you ain't coming up in here without a fight. <laughs> Whew, I feel like preaching. I feel like preaching. Whatever you agree with, you empower. Huh? The enemy keeps winning in our lives because we're agreeing with the wrong entity. So what happened in our text, the Bible says that the children of Israel, the sons of God, the sons of Israel, begin to cry out to the Lord. In other words, when they fell out of agreement with their condition, God says, now I'll work with you. Whew. Now I'm going to help you. Because if you disagree with your enemy, you only have one other choice. you got to agree with me. Amen. If you disagree with me, you only have one choice. you got to agree with your enemy. But when the Bible says they begin to cry out to the sons of God, God says, now I'm going to come in, and I'm going to put a reformation in your hand. I'm going to put reformation back in the land. I'm going to put a reformation back in your life. Let me put it to you in our terms. I'm going to put a revival back in the land. I'm going to put a turnaround back in the land. I'm going to put a, put a comeback back in the land. I'm going to put a yes in your spirit. I'm going to put an amen back in your spirit to the things of God. When they fell out of agreement with their condition, the Reformation came into the land. We have to be careful that we don't continue to foster an agreement 
with our enemies through compromise. Come on, church. Through mixture or worldly influence. We've got to go here. Go with me to uh, just, this is where we left off Sunday. Go with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, guys, I think I gave it to you on the screen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 4 says, For a time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Because all they want to do is have their ears tickled. <laughs> In other words, they just want to hear what they want to hear. Uh, and they will accumulate, gather together for themselves, teachers, in accordance to their own desires. In other words, they just, they just going to gonna cherry pick what they want to hear. Uh, and, what, and, what, and, and they will turn away their ears. This is a big one. From truth. And they will turn aside to myths, or we could say lies. I'm perplexed by the amount of people in our nation that will believe a lie. I am perplexed by the amount of people. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why. Because in the last 50 years, the church, the pulpits in America have not done a good job of preaching the truth. We've watered the truth down to a motivational message. A feel-good message. Hope you get your blessing. Come in here with your praise on so you can leave with your praise on. And we just, we, 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 we relegated the kingdom of God to a bunch of motivational therapy. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. I came here to preach today. And, and, then, and then when the church begins to preach the truth, it is so foreign to the ears of the people that are hearing it because we have been so indoctrinated with the world's influence that when you preach truth, they think it's a lie. And so, so we have to be careful that, throw that scripture back up there for me, guys, that, that, that we don't keep our ears tickled, right? For the time will come when they will have their ears tickled and they will turn on the side from miss. Okay, go with me to the next verse, verse number five. Verse number five, you got that one? No? All right, that's okay. Let me go, let me go this way. Somebody say they will not endure. He says they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. They will not endure sound doctrine. It means that sound doctrine will not always be celebrated. Sound doctrine has to be endured. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's hard to get doctrine to people who have no endurance. When... When, when, when people haven't been taught to endure anything, and they don't, and pe people don't want to endure something unless it makes them happy. <laughs> man, y'all about to shout me down, and I can't find, I, can, I got some money, I'll buy an amen. I got, can I buy a vow? Can I buy something? It, the church is not called to be happy. The church is called to be holy. And what, what makes me joyful in the midst of affliction, it's not the circumstances, it's the joy of the Lord in me. We have the fruit of the Spirit, do we not? If you've been born again, you carry the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, patience, peace, all those things, right? There's nine of them. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Happiness is an emotional feeling. And, 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 and so somebody could have came here and said, you know, I'm just, I'm really depressed because I can't pay my bills. Well, here's $100,000. I bet you depression will leave. Amen. <laughs> got, thank you, Sandra. You know, with, Sandra, I'm going to preach to you. You got me. I'm working with you. The, the rest of y'all lying. Turn into myths. <laughs> it's, it, if, if you're struggling financially and somebody gives you a hundred thousand, a million dollars, all of a sudden that emotional, don't feel like nothing, don't feel good about it, all of a sudden you're going to get happy because your circumstances change. But the Bible says it was the joy that was set before him that caused him to endure the cross and despise the shame. The same joy that Jesus had to get through the progress of life is the same joy that will live inside of us now watch this it says it says it says and, and, and the, the, that next verse we don't say and, and they will not endure hardships the emphasis that Paul is telling his spiritual son Timothy he said there's going to be many who will be compelled to be satisfied by their appetites through a contaminated audience 
in his book, Mario Murillo, he said this. He said, it's the crime of a contaminated crowd. Because Paul was writing to Timothy about the church, not the world. It may shock you, <laughs> but most of our painful disappointments don't come from the world. They come from the church, and they will oppress people who preach the truth. Because we live in a culture that don't want to hear the truth. And because we don't want to hear the truth, it puts the church in the category to compromise. And this, 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 is, where, this is where we got to get locked and loaded. He said, people are not going to endorse sound doctrine. He said, Timothy, you got to be aware of this. He said, you got to learn how to preach in season and out of season. You got to be ready at all times. You got to be, you got to be on your toes. You got to be a good strong believer in the midst of the culture that you're living in because there's going to come a day it's not that the world's going to turn on you the world's always going to be against the truth what's going to be the problem Timothy is that the church is going to turn on you because when you stand for something that is biblical when you stand for something that is right you're going to upset a lot of feel good me too want kind of people emotional response people that have no foundation that has no sound doctrine and he says, Timothy, you got to be careful that you endure hardship like a good soldier and preach the truth. <laughs> what used to be known when I was growing up as discipleship, they call it legalistic now. Are you just being legal? No, I'm just trying to serve God in purity and holiness. <gasps> I, I know I, I'm trying to be careful I got a long ways to go in a short time to get there when you live in a mixed culture you have to be careful that we don't always keep excusing sin sin is never right I don't care how bad the struggle is in your life well, I just became vulnerable. <laughs> well, I just gave in. <laughs> well, the peer pressure was too strong. It's called mob control. And, and, and what happens is you get a people long enough believing like that, and it creeps into the doors of the church. Sound doctrine can't be endured because in order for sound doctrine to be endured, that means you got to fight something out. You got to make a yes, a yes, and a no, a no. And sooner than that, you got to look at some of your party friends and say, you know what? I just can't get drunk this weekend no more. I'm going, I'm going after God. I just can't keep having sex outside of marriage. Sooner or later, you just got to peel back and say, you know what? There's a God on the inside of me. And the more I say yes to him, the more I am empowered against the sin that's against me. But the more I agree with the sin against me, I disempower God. And I empower the sin to rule and reign over my life. Push on somebody telling them every generation has a time. This, this is pretty good. I, I, I've been reading a lot from uh, Dietrich Bum, Bum, Bumhofer. Thank you, Miss Susie. Bumhofer uh, lately. And uh, he said this, he said, cheap grace, this will be on the screen, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It's baptism without church discipline. It's communion without confession. It's absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without a cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Cheap grace. People don't endure because they just want their ears to be tickled. Yeah. Cheap grace. I remember when I was growing up, I know we don't preach it like this no more, probably should, but I remember when I was a teenager and I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I can remember the preacher saying, y'all don't take communion unless y'all fall asleep and die. I'm like, Kitta, <laughs> Shunda. <laughs> Like, like you had to repent. 
you, you, didn't, you didn't want to come to the table of the Lord with any fault in you that has not been repented of. I can remember my mom. My mom should have been a Bible teacher. Well, she was a Bible teacher the whole, my whole year. But she, she would say, boys, don't go to bed and not ask God to forgive you. You may not wake up. <laughs> Y'all got to know my mom, my mom is a jokester. She's a prankster. But, you know, when, when, when you 10, you don't, you, you don't know that's joking. You think it's serious. Like, for real? Like I, she said, when you wake up, you'll go to a devil's hell. You'll live there all the days of your life in the devil's hell. There'll be weeping and tormenting and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you're, when you're a kid, you get on that, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm for, forgive, me, for, forgive me for back talking. Forgive me, Lord. You know, as a kid, I, I didn't, I mean, that was probably my worst sin was I, I back talked. I had a, that's, maybe that's why God called me a preacher because I talked too much. I just had to get my language sanctified. And I never had a problem with cussing, never. I, my parents didn't cuss growing up. I mean, I never heard it hardly ever. Every now and then my dad would slip up. My mom made him mad, you know, just slip it out. But it, it wasn't that much. So I didn't grow up with a cussing problem. Now, I had friends that cuss, but I didn't grow up with a cussing problem. But I remember one time we were playing football, and I got so mad, so aggravated, because I felt like the guy did me, did me a, a cheap shot. And I looked at him and said, what the? It's wrong with you. I said, hell. Y'all trying, what did he? I said, what the hell is wrong with you? And when I went home and went to bed that night, I thought my hell word was going to put me in hell. So I'm laying on the bed, Lord, please, God, forgive me. God. I, oh, what a wretched sinner I am. <laughs> But see, I grew up like you didn't take communion without confessing your faults and sins. And, and in fact, you should go confess, confess to one another if you have problems with somebody in the body. Because if you take it, you take it in an unholy manner. But we have got this cheap grace in church where God just winks and says, oh, it'll be all right. Just keep living in your sin. Just keep fooling around with darkness. Just stay where you are. Oh, it'll be all right. I'm just trying to tell you, that is a myth. That's a lie. That's not sound doctrine. <laughs> you have to endure. That word endure literally means to stand firm. And it literally, the, 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 the understanding literally means not to lose courage under pressure. Mm. Don't lose courage under pressure. You don't know what's in you until you're squeezed. <laughs> I didn't have a cussing problem, but that boy brought it out of me. Huh? My mom said she didn't have a cussing problem, but I brought it out of her one time. <laughs> See, see the, the, the problem is when you're used to living in a nation, when you're rewarded for your natural abilities alone, after a while, you start thinking your natural abilities, your education, your W-2, your income, your business, your status in the community, you eventually start thinking you did it all by yourself, and now you can manage it better without God. Hmm. You can get so used to being blessed that you forget, had it not have been for the Lord on your side. And we live in a nation where we get so blessed just because of the nation. Let me tell you something. America, and I, don't, don't try to put me in politics, but America did not become great because of the, uh, of the presidents that we've had. America became great because we started out of the scriptures of God's word and it was built on a foundation of fear and holiness towards the things of God. And now when you turn back away from the things of God, God sees it as evil in his sight and he's going to let an enemy come in and overthrow you because you should have been stronger than the enemy that's coming against you because greater is you that is in you
than he that is in the world. You, you got to recognize that, that your enemy, he might be more powerful toe-to-toe -to -toe in a natural realm, but he is not more powerful in the spiritual realm. You can get so used to taking God's blessings for granted. And for so long now, I'm about to preach, I'm about to get to my point. For so long now, many churches, the church cultures in America have been steeped in a culture of powerlessness and compromise. To the point that we have now marginalized ourselves and we have lost touch within the very society that we are called to redeem. When that happens and we get locked into tradition, we have no relevance in society. And we end up, watch me now, fostering a faulty theology, a faulty doctrine stripped of any spiritual authority. And the end result is a dead church culture that don't have anything to offer a society that's perishing right in front of us. I just came to redeem it. I came to call it back. I came to put the church back in the fight. I came to say back to the church, I, and I can't speak for every church. I can just speak for this house. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not going down without a fight. We're going to stand up, and we're going to believe God in the midst of every chaotic situation. We're not going to let the devil come in here and run rush out over us. See, our problem, I'm, 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 I'm about to get there. Our, our problem is, our problem is, 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 is spiritual. And when you stay in oppression long enough, if you're not careful, you get acclimated to a condition that you were never designed to live under. You were never designed, Israel, to live in caves and dens. But because of the year after year of the enemy coming in against you, you got conditioned, you got acclimated to your situation and now you call your situation normal it might be normal according to your experience but it's not normal according to the doctrine of God that lives on the inside of you and we are trying now to pass laws to make people look moral but we want to take God out of the picture this will be on the screen for you you can't get people to act good or to have good morals when you keep moving God from the equation. Y'all ain't got to say amen. I'm coming down that road. Morality does not work in a vacuum. Morality comes from God. But instead we are trying to pass laws to make you look moral. But, 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 but they are not. And it don't matter how many laws you pass. Until we have a spiritual awakening, we are still living under the domain and the threat of an enemy that has one thing in his mind, and that is to devastate the blessings of God in your life. And this will be on the screen. There are many things that are not illegal, but they are, but, but, but they are immoral. And just because our governments legalize something that God calls a sin, don't make it right. It might be right in the eyes of man, but it's not right in the eyes of God. And sooner or later, you got to have this thing inside of you that says, I'd rather please God than men. I'd rather be in fear and holiness of the God that loves me, that called me out of death and destruction, than to risk my life trying to please everybody around me. I'm not going with the mob rule. I'm not going with the culture of deceit. I'm not going with the culture of lies and myth. I'm going to put my trust in a God that's above all ever God. See, and I believe that God is looking for some believers. Maybe it's just us. Maybe here we are. We're living in this particular time. God is looking for some believers that will look at a backslidden culture. He's looking for some people in the body of Christ, some believers that will look at a religious order and say, we are not going to live our lives polluted by the compromise in the mixture of the world in which we've been called to deliver. Not going to live that way. The church has to be salt and light. The church has to be set apart. The church has to be different. We have to be other than. Come on, talk to me up in here. That, that, that word holy means to be other. It means to be set apart. 
That's what the church ought to be. The church, when the world looks at the church, they ought to see something different. They ought to see something that has some life to it, something that has some power to it, something that says I, I can walk through anything because with God on my side, whatever is against me, God is always for me. You got to have a people that know how to walk through hell and high water. You might take a beating every now and then. You might come out with some scars, but you're coming out. You're coming out. I went in mad. I went in messed up, and I came out bloody. But the fact is, I came out, and my enemies did not prevail against me. Push on somebody and tell them every generation has a time. Every generation has a time. We must understand, let me, let me work this out, just got a few minutes left. We must understand why Jesus was crucified so that we realize the importance of our involvement in the culture. I'm trying to get to Gideon, I'm, I'm working, I'm working. Gideon, hang on, we're coming. We've got to realize the importance of our involvement. This is, listen, it, it, when I talk about our involvement, I'm talking about politically and socially. The political and the social structures of our world. Many people think that Jesus was crucified and the early church was persecuted because they were advocating a new religion. That's not true. The truth of the matter is that the Roman culture was already filled with polytheism, which is the worship of many gods. So a new religion on campus didn't mean nothing to the Romans. The Romans didn't care that another religion was beginning. There were many forms of worship in the Roman culture. They crucified Jesus and they persecuted the early church and Jesus' followers for one reason, because they believed him. That's a tweetable moment right there. When he declared himself to be king over every king and ruler over every ruler, when he declared himself to be king, they said, uh-uh. This is more than a religion. This is about lordship. And the choice is still before us today. You're either going to serve Caesar or you're going to serve Christ. We have to decide which one will be Lord. You have to decide. I'm, I'm talking to the church. The church has to decide, are we going to serve Caesar Oh, we're going to serve Christ. And to serve Christ, that means I'm probably going to be persecuted. To serve Christ, that probably means I'm going to be talked about. I'm going to be lied about. I'm going to be ostracized. I'm going to be pushed around a little bit. But ladies and gentlemen, at the end, listen, Jesus was not crucified because he was politically correct. The disciples did not lose their life because they were politically correct. They went against the political machines of their day, and they said, we're going to serve Christ and Christ alone. Christ alone. My paradigms are not built out of my experiences. My paradigms are not built out of the way people want to mold me into their little candidate box. My paradigms are not built out of a political order. My paradigms are built out of the Bible. And I want to serve Jesus at the highest level according to Scripture. Push on somebody and tell them everybody has a time. Everybody has a time. Because watch this now. Culture can be either ruled by the instability, this will be on the screen, by the instability or the changeable ways of men or by the immutable word or the law of God. It's going to be ruled by one of the two. Therefore, what a nation, hear me out, what a nation does in regards to health care, immigration, poverty, environmental issues, economics, politics, education, science, is as much concern of Jesus that's what goes on in the church. It's a big concern. It's a big concern. And it's up to the church always to leverage her influence and to promote the governments of God in a society system and please the Lord by reflecting that through biblical principles. That's why the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, 
but, ye, but be ye transformed. Romans 12, 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Not talking about the earth. It's talking about the systems. The systems opposed and alienated against the things of God. Don't be wrapped up in the systems of this world. Don't be conformed by the systems that are working against you. Let me put it to you the way we're fighting it right now. Don't be controlled by the Republicans. Don't be controlled by the Democrats. Don't be controlled by the independents. Be controlled by the government of God. And, mu and mirror your life according to the government of God. And let it play out in the earth. Let it work out in the earth. Let the promises of God work out through your life. Let the truth of God prevail. Let every man be a liar. But let the word of God prevail in the midst of every controlled system. Yeah. It's time for the church to stand up in our faith. Hey, talk to me. Stand up in our faith with some authority and engage the culture with truth and righteousness and take back the kingdoms of this world. Listen, I don't get into a debate with a Republican or a Democrat. Now, if you want to talk, I'll talk about the word. Did it, did, did you, is it in the Bible? If it's in the Bible, I'm for it. If it's your opinion, I don't care. I don't even care to hear it. I don't care. I, I don't care if you want to philosophize your sin. I don't care if you want to try to therapeutic, make, make, make therapy out of your sin. I don't care if you want to live in your sin. I don't care how you want to compromise the mixture of your life. The Bible calls it sin. The Bible says I'm against it. God says I'm not for it. That puts me in this government and not in nobody else's. I'm just trying to help somebody. People getting all jacked up in the church. If we just get on the Lord's side, we'd stop all the crazy confrontational issues. Man, I, just, I don't understand. Well, I don't either. I don't understand half, half of y'all. I don't understand it. I don't understand people. I, I don't. I don't. But I understand the fruits of the Spirit. That means casting out devils is more than just casting the devil out of a person. It means that the church has got to involve so we can cast devils out of systems. Huh? That's what we got to do. I know I can cast devils out of my family. I ain't got a problem with that. I've done it. Praise the Lord. Cast devils out of our neighborhood, our communities. When's the church going to start casting devils out of their cities? Let me show you this scripture. I got four minutes. Let me show you this scripture. Y'all know I'm going to wear out these four minutes. Colossians 2.15. Guys, throw that up there for me. Can you real quick so I don't have to. It says, for the time will come. No, here we go. When, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, talking about Jesus, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them. Over them. Because he disarmed them. He disarmed. Jesus disarmed Satan, now it's up to the church to displace him. Jesus is not going to displace the enemy. That's the job of the church. He overthrew the enemy. He disarmed the enemy. But now the church has to evict him. <laughs> Hallelujah. The church is called to enforce the victory of Calvary. And change the spiritual climate of society until it begins to give a reflection of heaven's culture. That's so why we got to have people involved in politics because our politics are jacked up. We got to have righteous people in there, not a bunch of clowns. We don't need clowns in politics. We need righteous people that will govern according to the Bible. Not according to mob rule. The most dangerous entity on our planet is the Supreme Court system. The Supreme Court system has done more damage to America in the last 60 years than any other entity on this planet. They were the ones who legalized abortion. 
They were the ones who said a gay man and a, a two gay men can get married. Pretty soon it's going to be you can marry a, ped a pedophile. You can be a pedophile and marry a child. Next thing is coming down the road, you can marry your pet. Y'all yeah. think I'm crazy. You watch, it's coming down the road. Somebody say, oh, it'll never. Listen, it'll, I'm telling you, it's coming down the road. And what you elect in power, you empower people to make judgments against God. What is the Supreme Court? I'm, I'm telling you, because when you don't have righteous people sitting at the top level, when you don't have righteous people that rule according to conviction and according to the Constitution of the United States and according to the precepts and the doctrine of the Word of God, then you get mixture, you get compromised, and now you got a nation that's in chaos. Now you got cities that are being burnt down. Now you got injustices that are moving throughout the land with nobody seeming to know what to do. It's because we got to have some people with some righteous guts, with some righteous people that will walk back into places and secure that mountain. Look, the, Ephesians 3.10. Guys, let me throw that. I got one more minute. Y'all know I'm going to wear it out. One more minute. Ephesians 3.10. For the time will come. No, that's here we go. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through politics. The wisdom of God is not made known through politics. The wisdom of God is made known through the church. Who's it made known to? Not to, not, not to people. It's made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. In other words, you start evicting the devil. You start evicting principalities and powers. And you put righteous people in rulership. Now you got a heavenly place. Yeah. Let, me, I, let me close with this. This, is, this, ain't my, this, ain't, this ain't Gideon yet, but I'm getting there. Look what happens when the church is no longer... The conscience of society. Okay, this is what happens. I, I'm not even going to preach them. I'm just going to give them to you. Number one, today's complacency becomes tomorrow's captivity. When the church is no longer the conscience of society, today's complacency becomes tomorrow's captivity. Number two, you become whatever you tolerate. If you don't like what you're getting, change what you tolerate. No such thing as a comfortable Christian. Well, I just, I just want to be comfortable. I didn't go looking for a fight. Neither did I. The fight came in our yard. I told you all that last week. I didn't go looking for a fight. They threw the punch. The enemy crossed over into our lane. We were doing fine. We just preaching. We getting people saved and healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. But you want to bring politics into the church and you want me to be quiet? Number three. Number four. Which one are we on? Number four. Three, three is no such thing as comfortable Christian. Number four, trust must never be compromised on the altar of political, cultural, or sexual expediency. Now, somebody can take those four points right there and wear them out. Those are preaching points to our culture right there. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand, the church is not built to keep bending over backwards for the sin of a nation that we're called to influence into righteousness. The tide turned for Gideon when they begin to cry back out to God. When the church starts crying out to God and not a party line, we'll turn the tide. Now, we got people in here, you, you work your party. I don't care. You, you ain't bothering me. You can't even make me mad. I'm way beyond being mad at over disagreements. I'm way beyond. That's petty in my book. That's petty. But I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. If the church don't pull it together and unify as a body that stands on the word and not a word, Our nation won't ever become any more than what it is right now. The church didn't, I said this to you last week, I think, the church didn't spiritualize politics. Politics politicized spirituality. When you obey an evil law, 
you are at odds with the divine law. We ain't got time. Somebody say, Gideon, hang in there. <laughs> we'll get to you next week. Come on, Pastor Porter. I, I know I got to close. And that, that's, I, I preach from an individual standpoint to, to a church standpoint to a nation. I, I, I'm trying to cover it all. But at the end of the day, my relationship with God is paramount. I'm not going to give an answer for you except for what I preach to you. I'm not going to give an account for your life. I will be held accountable for what I say. That's why I ain't intimidated by the stares or the glares. Because <laughs> those eyes that are flame of fire are much more intimidating than your little pupil. <laughs> and that's the God's honest truth. My wife knows I had to get over that because I had to fear a man big time. It, it, still, it tears me up today to get in this pulpit. There ain't nothing easy about it for me. I fight everything I got just to get up here and grab this microphone. It ain't never easy. And I don't think it ever will be. It's just the way God's wired me. But at the end of the day, I'm not intimidated by the culture that I've been called to redeem. I'm not intimidated by religious people who don't want to change. And I'm not intimidated by a church that don't want to be biblical. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm just talking about the church in general. This is a good church. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is a real good church. And there's some God-fearing, loving people in this house. And we ought to praise God for it because that's what my wife said earlier. That ain't everywhere. That ain't everywhere. And, and y'all need to know. Y'all need to know. I know this is a holiday weekend. We got a lot of people out. But y'all need to know. This is the easiest place in the world to preach to. People all over the world want to come here and preach to because the atmosphere is electrified. And this church, I tell people all the time, if you'll just preach the word, this church will eat you alive. They'll throw a chair at you. They'll throw a baby at you. I ain't talking about literally. I'm just talking about, you know, you just like. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm tired of Midian. I'm tired of a spirit ruining and raiding and robbing what God has blessed me with. If you're tired of it, get on your feet and just begin to lift your hands and just begin to cry out to God. Come on, Gideon. Come on, Israel. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voice for about 30 seconds and say, God, I'm tired of it. God, I'm tired of it. Come on, just say, God, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the enemy's hand in my family. I'm tired of the enemy's hand in my life. somebody just get a breakthrough today? Can somebody just break it through today? We're going to break it today. Power of You've Midian the power. comes down. You've overcome principalities. Hey. You're greater than the systems. I was born for this hour.
yes we do. real quick.